Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 589th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Weshe for the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today we have Yudi Lettergore. He is a VP, a guru, a top dog at gong.io. Uh, I had Chris Orlobe back uh, or on the show back almost almost six years ago. Crazy. Uh, February 2017. But these guys uh, use artificial intelligence to listen and analyze calls uh, and help you figure out what works. So I love it when people say, oh, scripts don't work. The hell they don't. Bad scripts don't work. Trying to wing it on a script, not internalizing a script doesn't work. But there are key things you can and should and must say and not say and specific ways to say them and not say them. Or you, you know, if you want to be a top selling professional, just plain and simple. So I've been teaching scripts since at least 2006 when I learned the power of them. Uh, But again, it's good scripts. Every single one of my consulting clients right now that pay me thousands of dollars a month, I am helping them create outbound scripts. And we are using that. We're chopping it up. We're using them for outbound emails. We're using them for outbound direct mail. Uh, We're using them in social media outreach. Uh, Don't tell me these don't work. We take, we take the essence of these uh, messages, these scripts, and we create talking points. We create frequently asked questions and should ask questions on their website. This stuff works because it's fundamental, but go ahead and push back on me. That's fine. I guarantee you're not making your numbers. Stop fighting me on this. If you want help, come see me. If you want the exact scripts and you want them for cheap, go to makeeverysale.com. I give it away. I, it's included in, in the program. And it's like $149. It's 41 videos. It's, it's a workbook. It's, it's, it's damn near everything in the kitchen sink. If you want to talk about it, if you want to get that for free, join the Gorillas of Growth, gorillasofgrowth.com. You get the program. You get... Uh, everything in the Make Every Sale program, but then you get the private group and you can ask me questions every single week live. You can ask questions in the group and I, I answer them quickly. It'll help you. I will help you grow your sales. Okay. If if CEOs and CFOs and founders of multi million, one of my companies, clients right now is $90 million. From ze- they went from zero to $90 million in the last four years. They have plans to get to a billion. I'm helping them with this. Another client uh, has doubled every year for four years. They're building a new factory in a town in Texas. Uh, They have plans to get to $100 million in the next two years. I help them with this. You got to get your scripting right. So we're going to talk about that on this episode, okay? I've already mentioned makeeverysale.com, gorillasofgrowth.com. Get you some help. If you want to go to my website, <coughs> uh, still coughing. I'm not going to take that out. Uh, I'm doing this on uh, on Halloween, just like I did the last one. I batch these a little bit. I'm going to Texas, watch Air Force and uh, Army. Air Force better win, okay? That's all I'm saying. But uh, I'll make this quick because I'm still coughing after 11 days. But I am over the worst of it. <coughs> Goodness gracious. I need another cough drop. Uh, all right, makeeversale.com gorillasofgrowth.com get you some of that once you get started there come back and listen to this episode with Udi Udi Lettergore CMO at gong.io with a very cool neon sign welcome to the sales podcast man how the heck are you I'm great Wes great to be here thanks for having me so uh we were talking just a second ago so Chris Orlob he's the founder right I had him on episode 233 so it's been a minute uh, maybe a few years, but, um, you are the CMO. You've been there six years up in SF and, um, y'all are doing some cool stuff around AI and helping salespeople sell mo better. Is that, is that, is that a good synopsis? That, that is not bad. Yes. We, we do AI for sales, otherwise known as revenue intelligence. And for those who've been living in a cave and haven't come come face to face with it yet, uh, what it does in, in a really quick nutshell is it captures all of your sales team's customer interactions 
whether they're over a Zoom call like we're having now or over a phone call or an email or a chat or a text message or however you want to communicate with your customers. So it captures all of those, then uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to analyze those interactions and see if it can find patterns of what's working better than other stuff on your team because you know some salespeople are gonna do better than others. So the AI actually understands why. And finally, it surfaces insights that every sales team can use for their leaders to personalize coaching moments, for the reps to coach themselves and learn from other reps on their own team. So this improves winning more deals, getting better win rates, creating a better buyer experience. So, because what you're doing it, I, it's listening to both sides of the conversation, right? And Correct. It, is one side more important than the other? Because if I remember right, it, it's you're like a new company will, uh, you'll trial it with their best salespeople to kind of see like what's, why are these guys good for this company? And then help maybe create a talk track or a cadence for the rest of the team. Is that accurate? So that, that is definitely part of it, yes. Um, to answer your first question, I believe both parts of the conversation, what the customer is saying and what the salespeople are saying, are equally important. Here's why. Um, it's kind of obvious to understand why companies want to know what their salespeople are saying, because us marketers and sales leaders can use that to see who's using the latest pitch, who's doing it better than others, who's asking the right questions, who's not offering a discount preemptively if we don't have to. All those things are super important. But no less important is what the customer is saying, because that gives us the voice of the customer in the most straightforward way you could hope for. So if customers right now are going through layoffs or budget freezes or worried about the economy, that'll show up. And you can see that both at the individual call basis and on the aggregate level. So for example, you can tell if your customers are talking about the state of the economy 32% more this month than they were last month. You want to know that because you might want to change your discount strategy or something about your messaging. You'll want to know which competitors your customers are bringing up in the call, how often, in which segments, in which geographies, how does that affect the win rates of customers who brought up competitors so you can change your pitch accordingly. So I hope you agree now that both sides of the conversation are super important. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, I just looked it up. And um, so Chris was on six years ago. Uh, yes, Chris was my first hire. I, I hired Chris onto the marketing team uh, way back in late 2016, and he was on the marketing for three on the marketing team for three years, and then on the sales team for three years and gone. Uh, one of our one of our A players for sure. Nice, nice. Uh, so, I guess a little bit has changed in these six years. Uh, I don't know presidents, pandemics, riots, inflation, my hairline. <laughs> nuclear war i mean you know just a few little things so so what what are you seeing what has gone on in six years like um let's start with what has stayed the same over six years of analyses of sales interactions i think one of the things that, that stayed the same is that people always knew that science is part art and part science but I think what's changed is that people used to shrug six or seven years ago saying, yeah, we'll never truly understand the science behind selling. And we'll just continue treating this as an art and craft sort of thing and learning from our mentors who learn from their mentors. And that's that's based on valuable human experiences, but they're very, very limited because there are only that many experiences any given person can have. What I think has changed is that we now realize, thanks to the companies like Gong, but others as well, that you do have access to the science behind the art of sales. You can make your team and yourself systematically better, just like other business functions have been doing for years. Can you imagine a marketing leader who couldn't talk about the conversion rates of their web pages or the click rates of their ads or the traffic on their website? I'd be fired if I couldn't talk about those numbers. Can you imagine a finance leader who didn't know all their efficiency metrics and how they've changed quarter over quarter? Of course not. But sales, sales have been allowed since the Middle Ages to mosey on along without 
looking at the science behind what they were doing for so many years. And that has changed in the last few years. And I think you're seeing that. All the companies offering any sort of process methodology and technology for sales are now incorporating science of the kind that Gong pioneered all those years ago and looking at not just what people think works, but what the data actually shows works. Mm -hmm. Do you get pushback? Um, because I can see some sales managers being afraid they're going to be exposed because most sales managers are promoted from within. Uh, they sometimes they're scientific. A lot of times they're just the most aggressive. Don't take no for an answer, work the system in inside, get some deals, uh, make shit happen. And now they're in management and they're just berating their people. When I had that territory, I made quota three years in a row. What are you doing over there? I mean, and now it's like, oh yeah, we're going to listen to everything and realize there's no training. Uh, you're, you're just berating your people. They're just winging it. Maybe you should go, right? I mean, is that, does that come up? Uh, absolutely. But I will say that it's dramatically decreasing over the years. You know, I'm sure when Henry Ford introduced his first Model T, people were like, no, I, I love my horse. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And when, when Jeff Bezos uh, introduced uh, online shopping for groceries, people were like, no, I want to feel and touch my apples. I, I can't order them. And then, of course, the pandemic happened and all of us moved over to, to ordering groceries online. And so there's always going to be the early innovators who see the vision of progress and technology and who are going to be the first to adopt it. And that's what we saw six years ago when we had really innovative leaders coming to us and say, I see what you're doing. I want to try this on my team. I have a feeling it's going to work. And nowadays we get a lot less of those objections. There's always going to be laggards and there's going to be conservatives who are trying to stop progress and believe that the way they've always done things is the best way to do it, or they're just afraid of trying something new. But I can honestly say that we've gone from serving in the early days, innovative tech companies to now serving a broad area of industries from telecom to manufacturing, to retail, to pharma, a bunch of industries that you don't automatically associate with being the first innovators to try the latest shiny new object. And they're all adopting technologies like Gong now. So this is this is the way that you can cannot stop. Or as, as others have said before me, progress cannot be stopped. And this is what's happening right now. And, and we're definitely seeing a lot less objection than we did six years ago. Yeah. Um, now, if I remember correctly, some of the the science that was discovered, because, you know, the, the old adage is you have two ears, one mouth, use them accordingly. Correct. But at least six years ago, what Chris had shared was that when it came to a closing call, when a decision was made one way or the other, that it was very even. It was like 5149. But the the big issues had already been resolved um, pricing, availability, compatibility, onboarding, whatever, you know, the big, the big gotchas. And it's like, okay, now we can kind of settle in and make a decision. Is that still holding true? I think so. I mean, it's going to change from team to team and, and Gong allows you to customize the best practices for your team. Even if you're a company that maybe has four different business divisions, the dynamics of the sales calls are going to be a little bit different between each division because you've got a different buyer with a different product and a different value proposition in a different category. I'll give you an example. If you're selling a product in a very new category, you probably need to do more explaining upfront of why your customers should care, what this is going to change for them, because it isn't obvious. Now, if you're selling a product in a mature category, let's say I'm selling email automation, that's about as obvious as toothpaste is to the right buyers. You don't need to explain what the importance of the category is and what kind of transformation it's going to, to create. You just have to go into articulating your competitive differentiators or asking any questions that your customer has. So these are going to change. And obviously, in different stages of the deal cycle, you want your talk time to reflect what is appropriate for that part. Because during discovery, you probably want the customer to talk about 80% of the time and show that you're actually listening to her answers. 
But then if you're demoing, obviously you're going to be doing most of the talking while still taking breaks to answer questions. And then as, as Chris probably alluded to, uh, once you get to that final sales call, you should probably be talking about 46% of the time. That's kind of the, the golden ratio that we found. So it is kind of similar to what our moms told us about using your ears twice as much as you use your mouth. Yeah, cool. Uh, and obviously in these six years, uh, the world has become virtual. Um, so what are you seeing now? And, and has there been a change uh, because m maybe six years ago, some of the initial calls were in per were on the phone to set up an in-person meeting. Whereas now probably the bulk of, of deals are being closed remotely. Right. So can you talk about what the shift has been, like how much more is being closed, uh, remotely and, and how this is helping, uh, in that situation? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Companies have been talking about digital transformation for a good 15 years now. And in some industries, like the tech industry, it's gone much faster than in others. I remember uh, a couple of companies ago, we were selling cloud software to companies in industries that told us, you know, while laughing, oh, we're never going to store our data on the cloud. That's just too risky. I mean, that's crazy. Um, and now, of course, who who's the one looking crazy? Because everyone's <laughs> using cloud in every single industry, including in the military and then the most sensitive intelligence units and banks and everyone else. So the, the movement towards digital transformation that's kind of been chugging along for the last 15 years saw its biggest leap forward since COVID. Things that would have taken five to 10 years just happened almost overnight because sales teams who had a very big field presence suddenly became inside salespeople overnight. Um, companies who did not want to close their doors had to quickly adapt the whole sales team and every other operation to work from home, right? Government agencies started working from home. Passport interviews were happening from home. All these crazy things that we always thought we'd have to come in and stand in line somewhere were happening from home. And so Gong was one of the, the lucky companies, the fortunate companies that really enjoyed what happened to business during that time when everyone was forced to work from home because now all these field sales teams that were saying, oh, we don't need this sort of technology. Our people are out in the field anyway. They're not going to record their calls. They're not going to document anything. Well, guess what? Now they're all sitting in front of their Zooms, just like you and me, and they need all the help that they can get to transform into what it means to be an effective inside seller. And so we saw companies like Zoom skyrocket and companies like Gong skyrocket and others who are helping these remote sales teams do, do better. Yeah. And that, um, and that hasn't changed, Wes. That, that, that hasn't changed. Yes, some companies are back to some sort of field presence, but I honestly can't point at a single company who said, yeah, we're just going to close all that inside sales infrastructure that we built over the last two years during COVID because we think field sales is all that much better. The, the, the movement is now back to a new hybrid, but I believe the number was somewhere in the 73%, if I remember correctly, of companies said that they're always going to continue to operate, at least in some parts, remotely and selling uh, as an inside sales team. Because it's just so much more effective, especially for lower deal sizes, where you can't justify jumping on a plane to visit every customer or prospect to close a small deal. Yeah. And do customers, do they need to meet with somebody? I don't need to meet with somebody. I mean, three and a half years ago, I bought my first Tesla on my app on a Sunday watching my daughter's soccer game. That was the exact example I was going to give Wes. That, 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 was, that was crazy. I was going to say people are buying but, cars now but, online. But that, but that was a known entity. And I did test drive my friend's car, right? And, and it had been out for a while. If I'm thinking mm -hmm. of a new CRM or, you know, I used to sell, I used to sell fiber optic technology, right? For testing and a little box, like about as big as a toaster, maybe. And that thing was 20 to $50,000, you know, they had to see it, touch it, you know, but I was only there for a minute and I'd leave it behind. Right. Cause I wasn't teaching them. They already had, I was replacing. So even then I could probably could get away with just shipping it and doing a demo remotely. So, I mean, the customers need to meet with a salesperson. In most cases, the answer is no. So, so here's, here's what we're seeing. We're seeing a, the B2C companies like Amazon have spoiled all of us in the sense that we now expect a seamless 
buying experience and we don't want to waste any more time than we absolutely have to on buying something. It should be easy, right? You can buy literally anything on Amazon with the click of a button from your, from your couch. So B2B sales are all going in that direction. And most products that have little customization and they're in a category that's well understood or the risk of trying is so low because it's like $9.99 a month. Why do you want to talk to someone even? I just want to click a button, give me access to log in. Let me figure out if this is good for me. So that's that's a lot of what's happening. Now, even if you go to larger deal sizes, I remember back in one of my previous companies, we were selling six and seven figure deals. And even the early investor said, oh, you're never going to be able to sell this over the phone. People are going to want you to whine and dine them and fly over there and show them this. And we said, you know what? You could be right, but let us try this. And we were we were stuck in some small industrial area in the middle of Israel, selling over the phone to the largest companies in the world. And they were buying six and seven figure deals and nobody was jumping on a plane. No whining or dining were involved. Why? Because we were selling software. It's cloud software. What could I possibly show you in person that I can't show you by sharing my screen over Zoom? It's literally software. It's on a laptop. It, it, you're going to see the same thing whether I'm sitting in Israel or whether I'm sitting in your office in, in Germany. You're going to see the exact same thing. Now, where there is still need for that human whining and dining experience is going to be, A, if you're selling some customized heavy machinery, you're selling an airplane, you want to show people around and all the little bells and whistles and where you click and where you push and where you jiggle it. Yes, they're going to want to see that in-person experience. And when you're trying to drive a huge organizational change and you want to meet with a lot of stakeholders and make sure you really understand what they're looking to do and how the product or service that you're selling ties in with their biggest strategic initiatives, that might be a process where, again, this is probably a seven or eight or nine figure deal. You're going to want to send over a salesperson and maybe an executive to go have those conversations. But that's maybe 5% of the deals that, that companies are selling today. Everything else you can really do inside sales. Yeah, but Udi, I was really hoping, you know, we could hop on a quick call and I could get to know a little more about you and your challenges and your company. Um, you know, so uh, you you really need me. <laughs> so here's the thing. I think there there is going to be a bright future for salespeople. Let me be clear. I'm not suggesting that salespeople are going away. In fact, I think the number of sales jobs is only growing every year. So salespeople can be can be safe. They're, they do have their job security. But, but here's the thing. Salespeople have unique talents that have not yet been replaced by the robots or AI. Salespeople can create rapport, can create trust, can create a relationship, and can help customers sift through a sea of information out there to pinpoint the exact solution that they need for their exact problem. And that's where they're most helpful. Now, here's the bummer. If you look at researches like those published by uh, salesforce.com, they found that salespeople only spend 30% of their time actually selling and sitting on customer facing meetings. What the heck are they doing the other 70% of the time? Well, I'll tell you, they're on boring internal meetings and they're updating their darn CRM. Now, isn't it time that that changed so that salespeople could use 70 or 80 or 90% of their time for what they're actually good and passionate about, which is meeting with customers, creating those relationships, and advising customers on the best solutions? Because that's what customers want from them. And so solutions like Gong help you do that by taking away a lot of the mundane work and autonomously capturing all those conversations, updating your CRM, helping you forecast, and reducing the amount of time that you're in internal meetings or preparing for internal meetings like your your one-on-one -on -one sales forecasting weekly with your boss. What, why prepare for that and why create slides and why send a bunch of emails if it's all just there for you already captured in, in a piece of software? So salespeople have a bright future and I think technology is going in the right direction of ensuring that they can spend their time on things that they, they want to do and they're good at. Look, you're just trying to make me a Stepford salesman. You're going to take these scripts and I just have to regurgitate. You're, you're making me a robot, man. I, I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm an artist. Okay. I'm, you remember, I'm a peacock. I have to be free. So, yes. Mark I, think you, I think you, I think you do. 
I think you do. Yes. So, so I, I know you're half joking, but, but let me address that seriously for a minute. Um, what Gong and, and other companies are trying to do is not is not create robots out of you. Uh, we're not trying to create the, the Avon lady or, or the Tupperware party. We're, we're doing something very different. So there is a type of sales that's mostly consumer sales. If, if you're calling your, your internet provider or calling your, your mobile phone provider and you've got a problem, those reps have a high turnover because they're probably students on summer vacation. They get like eight hours of training when they start their job. And, and then they have scripts come up on the phone. Oh, if customer is angry, say this. If customer is really pissed, offer this discount. If customer is like ballistic, call your manager now. So that is a type of sales and service that is very common with B2C companies. And that is not what Gong is all about at all. So Gong mostly serves B2B companies where there is a complex sales process that cannot be scripted. And the assumption is that salespeople like you are tenured and experienced, and you don't want a script. You don't want a script. That's one of the reasons uh, when customers ask us, why don't you have real-time coaching? Just tell me on the screen what I should say. I'm like, no, you, you really don't want that. Just ask any B2B salesperson who's tried that, and they'll tell you it sucks. It sucks because it's just a distraction. They end up closing that screen because they don't want these things popping up in front of them when I'm trying to look you in the eye over Zoom and create a conversation and have a relationship. You don't want to see my eyes going left and right, reading from a script to you. Leave that. To, to, to the Comcast girl that you call to, to complain about your bill. That's that's a different situation. But in complex B2B sales, you actually want to coach reps, not during the call, but between the calls on how to reflect, what can I what could I have done better? What's a different type of opening or, or uh, objection handling technique I can use next time? How could I have mirrored or labeled my customer's feeling in a different way? You, you can't do that in real time and you don't want to do that. Got you. Okay. Um... I, I mean, I agree with all of that. I, I do teach some scripting to kind of open things. Um, but yeah, you gotta, you gotta be able to read people. You gotta read the room. Um, and man, when I got started with a professional coach, the first thing he made me do was record myself. How cringeworthy is that? It was terrible. I had to it's buy terrible. this little device, right? I'd been in sales for like eight years at the time and had made a hundred grand every year, uh, you know, at least since 1998. And, oh. um, oh my gosh, it was rough, man. But, but, you know, I had to record them and then send the wave file and then we'd hop on a call and, and listen to it, you know? So, it wasn't real time. Uh, it, it was it was relatively quick, but not real time. And man, I tell people all the time, you want to get better at something, go record yourself doing it. 100%. And, and to be clear, Wes, I do agree with you that there are instances where you want to use something that is scripted and tried and tested. If you're an SDR making a cold call, you've got 30 seconds to impress the pants off someone before they slam the phone down. You want to practice that 200 times. So you better be darn sure that you scripted that, memorized it, and you know how to do it in your sleep. If you have a few key wow moments in your product demo, you want to make sure you've practiced those so you can click through the product and say the right things and show the right things to get that jaw to drop. But for all that connecting tissue between those moments, you've got to leave room for being interactive, for reading your audience. Are they bored right now? Are they engaged? Can I see them likely multitasking on their email? Just stop what you're doing. Forget the script. Go back to connecting with the human being. Otherwise, you've lost the, you've lost the deal already. Yeah. I had that happen to me once. I was in I was in Las Vegas. I was working with this startup. We sold technology to healthcare. Um, it was one of our big verticals. And this guy was kind of cocky. He's like, "Yeah, you know, come on in." And you know, we go down in the basement because most IT guys were in the basement. And I'm sitting across his desk, and he's on his computer, right? And he's typing away, and he, he's asking me questions. And I finally, I just stopped talking. And it took like a long time for him to come out of his trance and look at me. And I was like, dude, it looks like you're busy. I'll come back later. <laughs> I just closed my stuff and left. <laughs> I'm like, There's a term we, we like to use. 
we 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 found data to support this but but there's a there's a great term which is embrace the awkward pause yeah. and for a fast talker like like me to pause for 3 seconds seems like an absolute eternity just try that put a put a watch in front of you try pausing for 3 seconds it is one of the hardest things ever but you get so much out of it you get so much out of it. I'll give you one example, Wes. One of the most effective places to use that awkward pause is if you're a salesperson and you were just asked about pricing and you presented pricing. The novice salesperson will wait about half a second, if, if even that, and then start retracting by saying, oh, but that's just the list price. Let me talk to you about discounts. Or if that's too much for you, I'll understand. Let's get creative. Just shut up. Just shut up. If you can actually shut up for three, four, five seconds, you'd be surprised how many times a customer thinks about what you just said for a moment, give them some time to process, and they go, that actually sounds reasonable. But nobody lasts that long. Nobody waits so, those three seconds. Uh, I've told this story before when this topic comes up. But, you know, I, I've worked from home for 22 years. And... You know, we have seven kids and a dog. Oh my gosh. And I live in a loud place. I'm like, I'm, I'm up on a hill, but there's a busy street below me. So sirens, car crashes, you know, uh, lawn guys. So I'm always on mute. Oh, I, I say something, I go to mute. A podcast, a lot of times I'll be on mute. And, um, and so on, on podcasts, it's happened, but on sales calls, because you know, when somebody's kind of in a, in a cadence, you're like, okay, he's going to keep talking, but then they surprise you and they stop and you're like, oh crap, crap, crap. And the phone has gone dark, right? Cause it's, it's in this power saving mode. So you gotta, you gotta tap the screen to get the screen on Then you got to find the unmute button and you're freaking out in the middle. Like, damn it. I didn't think, uh, you know, maybe you took a bite of food or something. So just that three quarters of a second to find the mute button and unmute. I've had people continue talking, right? Just that super short gap, even on interviews, like they'll keep talking like, oh, oh I, I, I couldn't get to the button. So I guess just be quiet for a little bit and they'll just, they'll just keep going. And, so and <laughs> risking being Captain Obvious, you know what type of people are way better than the other type of people at shutting up and waiting for that pause until the customer starts talking women oh yeah we All found this time. over and over every time we looked at it women are better listeners they know how to give their prospect time to digest and actually respond to something mm -hmm. and that's why they're usually better at all the the classic sales techniques of right question asking the right talk to listen ratio the right what we call the patience factor how long do you wait before you interrupt or continue talking after the customer finished women are better at all of that yep i, I mentioned it today on my weekly call uh and i always say that like, men are worse like my wife will say i don't need you to solve what i'm about to say i just need to vent oh okay so i'll just keep eating my peanut butter and jelly sandwich and just nod <laughs> you know it's like okay i don't I just had a men, game right before this call to make sure I'm not, my tummy isn't grumbling men, men jump to it and the more that we know you know the curse of knowledge is a real thing we want to jump in and solve something and like prove how smart we are, show that a-hole from junior high school that I really did amount to something. You know, it's like, dude, stroke your ego later. You know, exactly. shut your trap. It's so hard, exactly. much harder for a man. I've seen that for sure. 100%. Um, so on, on this ratio, though, you know, talking and listening and uh, like I've sold CRMs uh, extensively since 2007, 2008. Uh, it can be a complex sale. There's a lot of pieces and parts that even a simple one, there's a lot of things to show. Um, but I've always sold them quickly, you know, when others have struggled. Um, so, but like how much does the, the prospect really need to hear versus like hearing themselves? Because, you know, I'll hop on a call. They're like, okay, show me your CRM. And I'm like, do you have 12,000 hours? Cause this thing's big, right? Oh, and I wrote a 700 page book on it. So I know it kind of well, how much time you got, you know? And I'm like, 
I'd be happy to show you, but I, what's like one or two main things you're hoping this thing can do, right? I'll just yeah. immediately flip it on them and let them go, well, you know, we need mobile or we need Gmail inter interfaces or we need, you know, a, a quoting tool. Oh, okay. Walk me through that. You know, so I'm 20 minutes into this thing. I haven't even opened the software. So, so as soon as you have a product that is beyond one simple functionality and, and most mature software products have dozens, if not hundreds of features and functions, the best salespeople, what they'll do is they'll spend more time on discovery, understanding what are the one or two things that the customer really, really cares about right now. And they will jump to show only those things. And that is very different from the novice salesperson who will go on a rant and show the 450 features and at the end ask the customer, so what do you think, Mrs. Customer? And Mrs. Customer is already deep in her Instagram because she lost you like 230 features ago. And that, that is a huge difference that we observed in the best and the worst salespeople. That's why you can't script the entire demo. If you have more than one or two features, you cannot script the entire demo because you want to be able to pinpoint what are the one, two, or maybe three things that the customer really cares about and resist temptation. Don't show the other stuff that you might be super excited about, but it's not what the customer came to buy today. Yeah, but companies, they still try though, don't they? I mean, the marketing team gives the salespeople this 87 slide presentation complete with moving transitions and 12 point font, you know, and they're like, Oh no, every customer gets the whole presentation. I mean, they're, they're trying to script the sale, right? Well, you know, uh, and not to self toot our own horn again, but if you use a tool like gong for AB testing sales pitches, you can actually have different sales teams and different sales reps try different versions of full deck versus short deck versus no deck and actually look at their win rates. And uh, our, our software reads the, the slide titles as they're being shown on the screen. So we can tell you without even going into the calls, oh, these one used the full deck, these one used no deck, these one used the old deck. And now you can connect that back to the CRM and see what their win rates are. And you can start getting an idea of what's the best way to sell your own software. And sometimes the results will surprise you. Look, I'm not as smart as you, man, but I think you described an A, B, C test right there. Are you, are you tricking me? Are you tricking me? <laughs> this is absolutely true. Hey, I'll, I'll give you a real life example. We, we have a great customer um, in Canada. They're, I love the Canadians. They're the sweetest people on earth. Uh, we have a customer called Touch Bistro. They sell point of sale software and hardware for the restaurant business. And they became a Gong customer many years ago. And six weeks or so into using Gong, they called us and said, hey, we just had this amazing eureka moment. They, they wrote a case study with us about it. You can find it on our website. And the short of it is that they had some salespeople leading with their software features, and they had other salespeople leading with their hardware features. They sell these iPad sort of devices to go with their software because you need them for order taking and stuff at the restaurant. And they never quite knew if one was working better than the other. But a few weeks into using gongs, they found that those leading with the software features were winning at like 30% higher win rate than those leading with hardware. So that made it super easy for them to identify what is the right way to do this, retrain the whole sales team and see their win rates consistently go up. And I'm, I'm sharing this with their permission. So it's, it's an amazing story. And that's the power of putting some science behind the art and saying, hey, yes, there are two gazillion ways you could go telling the story of this product, but one of those ways is probably better than the others. Let's find out. Yeah. Um, well, I, I had a program you know, called The Art of the Close. And, and I've always told people, you know, selling is as much science as art. But say the typical salesperson is this effervescent, you know, outgoing, happy-go-lucky type that is tough to corner, uh, tough to control sometimes, you know. But I tell people, like, it's like we are as predictable as computer code. You know, if we got on this call and I was like, Oh, dude, look at that gong sign behind you. That's the gaudiest, ugliest thing. The colors don't match. Oh, that's just atrocious. What the hell were you thinking? I kind of know how you might react to me. <laughs> right. right. You know, but I give a sincere compliment. Like, dude, like that's legit. 
cool. You know, it's like, okay, maybe I like this guy. At least you don't dislike me. So, I mean, and, and those are extreme examples, but, but we, and again, it kind of goes to the scripting part there. We can set the stage, right? At least to kind of tip the odds in our favor. And, and I think like good salespeople probably do this and don't realize they're doing it and maybe push back. We say, yes, that's a good way. Open this. Here's one or two openings. Stick with them. Get, get things off on the right step. And then, and then, hey, all right. Correct. You know, right? Some sales people might, might start with asking, so how are you, Wes? And others might ask, how have you been, Wes? Now, that might sound like a, a small nuance. One of them actually works dramatically better. I'm going to keep you and the listeners in suspense. If you want to find out which ones work better, go to gong.io slash blog. You'll find which opening line actually works much better. Is it how are you or how have you been? Huge difference in how long you'll keep the people on the phone with I one of those an educated openers. guess on that. Mm-hmm. I, I won't tell you if you're wrong. But the point is, you're, you're right, Wes. Um, we're not going to turn inexperienced salespeople into masters of human psychology by using some technology or by giving them a script to read out of. But the best type of salespeople are the ones who have already educated themselves on the art of human psychology and social behavior and how do we influence people. And, you know, there are amazing books about this from Robert Cialdini's Influence to Chris Voss's Never Split the Difference. There's so many books that teach you about the human psychology of negotiation and selling and what makes people tick. But if you add on to that, what science is telling us right now actually works and which one of those opening lines will keep the guy on the phone for longer and when you should talk about pricing and how many questions you should ask, you can take a lot of the guesswork out of that and bring a healthy dose of reality, knowing what's actually going to work and and win you that deal. Cool. Very nice. So you mentioned your website. I'm going to link to that. Uh, should we just send people to your homepage? Is there a particular PDF maybe they should get? So there's a ton of free research on gong.io slash blog. That's where we publish hundreds of articles that are free for anyone to use and will help you better close your deals, better manage your pipeline. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm Udi Lettergore on LinkedIn. There's only one of me there. So pretty easy to find. And I'm, I, I'm happy to I help with anything you else. <laughs> there you go. And thanks again for having me, Wes. This has been wonderful. Yeah, this is awesome. All right. So I'm linking there. I just grabbed that. I am multitasking while we're going. So I'm linking to that. Uh, I'll grab your LinkedIn as well and add this here. Um, and then like who who's right for Gong? Can a can a one person shop, you know, a solopreneur consultant benefit from this? Do I need to have two or three salespeople? Uh, if I have 2000 salespeople, am I too big? So the, the short answer is all of the above, but to be more accurate, uh, while we do have some use cases from really interesting companies, I just heard one yesterday that a company that was trying to figure out its first product before it had any salespeople, the founders were using Gong from day one to record all their prospect conversations to go back to them and listen and figure out with Gong what they were talking about, where they were interrupting and getting visibly excited about an idea versus when they were just listening and were obviously disengaged. So yes, there are use cases for even a solopreneur. I would say that once you hit about three to five salespeople, that's when you should definitely consider getting Gong in because at that point, you've already noticed that one of those five is doing better than the other. And you can start transferring that knowledge and get the AI to figure out what are the winning patterns of Susie who's selling better than John so that John can start selling more like Susie. And of course, 2000 salespeople, that's, that's a no brainer. Uh, You know, some of our largest customers have way more seats than that. And they couldn't dream of running their sales work without Gong. Because John's goofing off on fantasy football, all right? Susie's focused, so that's why. But anyway. (laughs) All right, man. Well, Udi, thanks for coming on. Gong.io, C-M-O. Can we add some more initials in there? Okay, I think we're good right there. Thanks again for having me, Wes. And thank you everyone for listening this far. All right, have a good one. You too. So we're talking about revenue intelligence, AI and machine learning for salespeople. Get you some of that. Um. I love when he talks about surfacing insights for sales leaders for coaching. How are you coaching your salespeople? Are you coaching your salespeople? Do you have salespeople that are coachable? A lot of people, a lot of times they don't. 
So you got to figure that out. If you need help with that, I can help you with that as well. Okay. I can help you find, I can help you recruit, onboard, retain top sales talent. Hit me up if you have questions on that. Okay. I've got a program there. But again, people, usually you have more money than time. I'll help you find the right salespeople. Okay. I'll give you the program, walk you through it, help you with the first couple folks. Uh, it's just what I do. Uh, so like I said, go get you some. MakeEverySale.com, $149 right now. Or the Gorillas of Growth, GorillasOfGrowth.com. Come join us. Or for free, hold yourself accountable, 12 weeksapeak.com. Get you some. I'll go sell something. <laughs>